Okay, thanks very much. Um, sorry about that. Uh, the, the child care plans were arranged months and months ago, and then uh, no, this talk was arranged months and months ago, and then things happen. Anyway, thank you for having me. I'm very, very glad to be here. Um, I, as far as I understand it, I was invited in particularly in particular because while your program is very interesting and excellent and exciting, um, it might lack a bit of a gender perspective at times. Um, so there's, of course, a million things to say about gender um, and economics. Indeed, the latest Nobel Prize in economics went to somebody focusing on gender. Oh, there's so many of you. That's great. Um, but today I'm going to present something different. Um, I suspect that most of you read the paper that I sent. I don't know if it was required. In any case, um, I'm going to assume that um, many of you read it, but that some of you didn't. So it should work for everybody. Okay, so I am presenting this um, paper and this project. It's a huge thing. I've been doing it for years already. Um, and I'm very glad to talk about it with you in, in kind of these final stages of the project and to get your feedback and to hopefully give you some interesting insight on the discipline of economics. I know that not all of you are economists, but I think that the, the framework that I set up here can be interesting for you. So I call this the gender of economics. And what I'm really doing in this in this is I'm looking at the discipline of economics and I am analyzing the discipline of economics from a gender perspective, gender specific perspective. So what, how does gender play a role in the production of knowledge in the discipline of economics? Why I think this can be particularly interesting for you, even if you're not interested in gender, per se, and not interested in economics, per se, is because um, what I do here is I basically create a framework where you can analyze the whatever of whatever. <laughs> so gender is just an example. Um, it's an example that is near and dear to my heart. It's kind of the center of my academic work. Um, and it's, it's something I know a lot about. Uh, but we could also look at many other interesting categories. We could look at the, the race or the ethnicity or the economic class of a discipline, the nationality, the political orientation. We could also look at disciplines other than economics. Um, for example, even the natural sciences, there's a great example of how gender plays a role in biasing what knowledge can be produced in even natural sciences. There's this great, very recent book that just came out um, that looks at cases brought against MIT, um, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, one of the top you know, um, natural science universities in the world, um, and looks at how researchers there, one, one in particular, showed that literally women, female researchers were being given less lab space to do their work. So systematically women are being um, left out of the process of, of creating scientific knowledge, not just in, in social sciences like economics, but even in natural sciences. Um, so I do believe that economics matters. Um, I am an economist. Um, probably not, not for very long anymore. I'm kind of done with it, <laughs> but um, I do think it matters. And uh, yeah, gender is, is important to me. So how am I going to do this? And again, uh, I'm gonna keep the presentation sort of short because I wanna hear the discussion. Um, I know you have discussants, that's really exciting and hear what comes up for you. And again, I'm assuming that most of you read the paper. So um there's so much we can talk about in, in what I'm going to present. So um, let, let's leave more space for discussion. Okay, so how do I frame this? I set this up by thinking about what I'm calling elements of a discipline. In any, uh, in any academic discipline, you have different things that are going on in the discipline that 
lead to the production of knowledge in that discipline. Here I've listed eight. These are also the eight that I deal with in the paper. Um, actually, in the paper, I only deal with seven of them. I might change that. Um, so, for example, the personnel who works in the discipline. This is kind of the low-hanging fruit. You know, if, if a discipline is dominated by men, then you know, we have a gender issue. Um, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, we can look more at the culture and the environment of a discipline. So what does it feel like to give a presentation in that discipline? What does it feel like to walk down the hallway of a department in that discipline? What's the process in publishing? What are the core theories in the discipline? How is the dis how is this stuff taught? What is being taught and what is you know considered in this case economics? How are data in the discipline collected? And what are the methods used to analyze this data? So these are different elements of a discipline. And what I do is I think about at least one gender specific aspect of each of these things. And when I find that each of these things are indeed impacted by gender relations and gender norms, then I say, well, looks like the discipline of economics is affected by gender norms, and therefore economics suffers from some gender bias. So um, I guess the bulk of what I want to talk about is sort of going through each of these and, and showing, giving an example of how gender matters in each of them. Okay. If you have questions throughout, by the way, please interrupt. Um, it's been a long time since I gave a Zoom talk and it's a little awkward. <laughs> like for a long time, we were all used to talking to a screen, but um, I'm not anymore. So please do uh, feel free to interrupt and, and ask questions throughout. Okay, so let's dive in. Personnel. Well, uh, <laughs> there's kind of two funny things. It's not funny at all. Two things to say about it. If you actually look at the websites of a Department of Economics, which which I've done a number of times for different departments, it's pretty striking how heterogeneous um, the faces of economists look. There's a lot of white people. There's a lot of men. Um, a lot of kind of older people. And then when you do see women, you do see people of color, they're lower ranked. Um, part of this is kind of demographics, you know, it takes things, it takes time for, for things to change. Kind of everybody knows now that we should have more diversity and it's just taking time, um, but it's still rather striking. More, um, yeah, more whatever easier to, to kind of sell <laughs> as a point here. This is a graph from a 2000, uh, Zoom is cutting off the bottom of my slides, so I don't remember if it's 2017 or 19, I think it's 19 paper, um, or 21, I don't know. Um, this shows the share of women in different levels in economics. So Senior majors, these are uh, undergraduate students who are in their senior year, their last year, who have majored in economics. And what we see in 2017, about 35% of senior economics majors are women. First year PhD students, so people who took the next step in that year, about, I don't know, 32, 33% were women. And then we have associate professor, uh, assistant professors, associate professors, full professors. And the point is, this is what's called the leaky pipeline, that as you go higher in the discipline, the share of women is lower and lower. So women leak out of the pipeline, the career pipeline. So um, this has a lot of consequences, of course, not just for the individuals trying to have a career in economics, but for the discipline, um, as, as I'll show in, in several different ways. But at the end of the day, less than 15% of full professors in economics are, are women. And by the way, this is a, a good point to say, um, I just want to acknowledge the fact that I'm presenting a lot of data um, on gender and the quantitative uh, data that I'm using consider gender as something binary, male or female. So we have basically no data on non-binary people, no data on trans people in the discipline. There was a survey that asked economists about their gender identity and exactly 0% of people who filled out the survey um, identify as non-binary non or trans. So 
we just don't have the quantitative data. So um, please like, excuse me for that. I acknowledge the problem. I'm just working with the data that we have. So, okay. So this is the share of women compared to men. Um, yeah. So why does this matter? Well, this is going to have a lot of impacts that, that we'll see, but it also means that basically at the end of the day, who produces the knowledge in economics is mostly men. And that's kind of the first entry point when you think about questions of objectivity and representation in science, if 85% of the people creating the knowledge, or let's say generously 70% of the people in the, uh, of the knowledge is produced by men, um, then there's a bias in what questions will be asked and how they'll be answered. Just like if you have 70 or 80 or 90% of, of economics being produced by people from rich countries or first world countries, or the global north, or countries where there are no effects of climate change. The questions are going, to, not yet anyway, right? Um, the questions are going to be different. And, and the feeling that we need to look at different things, um, that, that's going to be different too. Okay, so the culture environment, the next element of the discipline. This is of course very difficult to quantify, but there is a very interesting paper um, that that does this in a way, or at least one element of it. Um, so these these people, I cited them, uh, Dupas and others, and this et al. By the way, is ninety nine people who um, did the actual work of collecting the data. Um, they they took videos. So now we have a recording of this seminar, so we can analyze this seminar too. They took recordings of seminars um, at top economics departments, and they analyzed these um, from a particularly linguistics point of view. And they asked the question, how are male versus female presenters being treated? And one of the main findings was that female presenters are asked many more questions than men on average. But the important thing is that the questions that women are being asked are on average more hostile. This matters um, first for the culture, the environment, how you feel as an economist presenting your work. You know, am I going to be kind of killed with questions before I get off the introductory slide? Um, it, you know, and, and how we treat each other. So if women are treated more, more aggressively, then that matters. That also matters for publications, which is of course the most important thing in academia if you want to stay in academia. This matters uh, for publications because the culture of a seminar room will, excuse me, will influence publications. Exactly because if you wanna publish in top journals, the strategy for doing so is truly not just have a great idea, get lucky with great data, <laughs> happen to be a big name person or be co-authoring with, with a big name person, but you also have to tour with your paper. So you have to go to the top departments and present your paper there. The reason that that's important is because in the room at the seminars will be editors and reviewers who are going to make the decision about your paper. If uh, a woman is presenting her paper and the environment is very hostile and the people in the room are asking demeaning questions and hostile questions and aggressive questions, then the mood in the room becomes, yeah, we don't have to take this seriously. And indeed, there's evidence I cite in the paper that um, the same quality paper by men and women, it's more likely to be accepted if a male writes it than if a female writes it, even in economics, even today. This might have to do with the culture. Um, it's hard to know what else might explain it. I mean, the authors of the paper that find that say that it has to do with a kind of, you know, out group identity and, and keeping the non-dominant group out, which, which gives more, um, more ego basically to the dominant group. Okay, so the culture, influence publications. Publications, of course, <laughs> comes back and influences the representation. So who becomes an economist? All of these things um, are interrelated. 
by the way, um, sort of just data on the links between these different issues. Um, this is an amazing statistic that publication in one of the so-called top five journals. So these are like the top big name journal in economics. If you get a publication in one of those journals, your chances for getting tenure at a, at a university increased by 310%. Um, but women are less likely to publish overall and in the top five. And um, part of this has to do with, in some ways, direct discrimination. So there's this literature that shows, on the one hand, female authors in economics are held to higher standards of readability in order to get their papers published. There's also, in, in many disciplines, including economics, evidence that female authors receive harsher reviews for their papers, papers of the same quality. Female authors receive less credit in terms of their chances for getting tenure from another publication uh, when their work is co-authored. And um, differences in writing style, different, there are differences in writing style by gender um, and things like how often, or if the author uses a first person pronoun, so saying, I find that, blah, 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 as opposed to this paper finds that, that men are more likely to use those more assertive language styles in economics and that they receive higher returns for using them. So when men use those kinds of words, the probability that their paper is published is higher. And when women use those kinds of words, um, that helps their publication probability less than it helps men. Okay, I know that this is a lot. <laughs> Sorry that I'm kind of running through. Um, again, please interrupt at any at any time. Okay, because this really is a lot of stuff. So hopefully you read the paper. Okay, um, theories. And again, I'm just picking up like one or two things uh, about each of the well, each of these elements of the discipline. Um, we could, of course, come up with with more. But it, I'm doing this to kind of just make the point that there's something going on, that there's some gender specific stuff going on in the discipline of economics, and that we should, you know, that we do have cause for concern that there are some biases in the production of knowledge in this discipline. Okay, theories. So Samuelson and Nordhaus, um, if any of you studied economics, you might've used this book even as an introductory book. This is, uh, I think the most used introductory economics textbook in the world. Um, I analyzed this book. It's a very, very big book. Um, and I looked through it to see how many times gender comes up. It comes up exactly in three places. The book is like 900 pages long, comes up in three places. One of the places that comes up um, is when they talk about the rise in women's formal labor force participation in the 60s. So then, you know, women were always doing plenty of work. Most of it was unpaid. Um, always women of color were doing paid work, but now white women entered. And so there was more interest. And in ex trying to explain the fact that now there were more women overall doing paid work, Samuelson and Nordhaus say, a change of this magnitude cannot be explained by economic factors alone. One must look outside of economics to changing social attitudes towards the role of women as mothers, homemakers, and workers. So basically, um, there's this big, huge thing going on in the economy that who is doing paid work is changing, but we economists, uh, we can't explain that. We have to look outside of economics to explain it which to me seems like a pretty big failure of economics. Interestingly, uh, Samuelson, you know, it's not that he's like blind. He said to the Joint Economic Commission to Congress in the United States in 1973, he said, if because of the dead hand of custom and discrimination, half of our population have a quarter of their productive potential unrealized, and that may be an understatement, then by simple arithmetic, a gain of between 10 and 15% in living standards is obtainable by ending these limitations and discriminations. So he's aware that there's discrimination by the so-called dead hand of custom. And yet he can say that to policymakers, but he won't say it in an economics textbook. 
So there's something about kind of what is allowed in economics and what is to be kept out of economics. And a lot of this has to do with economics' wish to be, um, uh, wow, the word is escaping me, not normative, but no, whatever. Like <laughs> um, not to, to not say anything about policy, but instead just describe things how they are. Um, so I think that this is an interesting uh, example of a shortcoming of what economic theories for a very long time uh, were allowed to address. By the way, this is a good time to say um, that the economics that I'm looking at here is contemporary mainstream economics. So things are changing a lot and there are many, many, many different fields of economics, different sorts of economics. Some of you might be familiar with ecological economics. There's also a whole branch of economics called feminist economics. Um, and, and these gender specific issues will be different in all of those subfields of economics. So I'm looking at what I'm considering the mainstream of economics and the mainstream in a more contempor contemporary sense. So if we want to talk about what that is, again, I go through it in the paper, uh, but I'm happy to talk about it here for anybody who didn't read the paper. Okay, let's go to the next element, namely pedagogy. So how economics is taught. And uh, the first thing to say here is that, of course, the gender of the professors plays a plays a role. So you know, if seventy five percent of um, at least assistant professors and and up are men, then it's basically going to be a man and probably a white man standing in front of a room telling you how the world works. Right. So so that kind of matters. It also is a is a question of what topics are covered in economics classes. There's this nice paper by Achari and Goldsmith Pinkham that show that um, for undergraduate students, women are more likely to say that they're interested in topics like health and education, family, um, crime, uh, or development. And male undergraduates are more likely to say that they're interested in things like monetary policy and finance. Well, in introductory economics classes, um, it's much more likely to see monetary policy and some finance than it is these other things. So there is, in that way, a gender bias in, in what is taught, you know, what first year and second year undergraduate students are even told what counts as economics. Of course, health and education and family and crime development, all of that is very much present in economics, but um, a, a student who finishes an introductory economics class might not know that. Okay, another point about pedagogy is how this stuff is taught. So do you have somebody standing in front of the room and telling you how the world works? Or is there more um, what's called feminist pedagogical techniques being used of more shared discussion, of fair, shared knowledge. So is there, I always try in my classes to kind of start from the assumption that the students know a lot and that knowledge can be very helpful for what we're doing here in the class and we can learn from each other and that I too have something to learn from the students in the room um, and, and that I'm not the only one here who knows anything. And a lot of classes are not taught that way, um, but that is probably an important way to teach, I, in, in my opinion, to, to kind of help create knowledge. Um, yeah, and the other thing about pedagogy is like, what counts as knowledge, right? What do we know? So if, if whatever, somebody doesn't have a lot of book knowledge per se, but has been homeless for some part of their life and the topic of the class is poverty um, does the experience that that student had of living in poverty themselves does that count as knowledge academically and the thing is in economics it pretty much doesn't so that's um yeah that, those are some issues in pedagogy that that come up Oh, and of course, related to that is who chooses the topics, right? Who and, and who writes the textbooks? And this goes back to the representation of who gets to be a professor and, and who gets counted as an economist. 
Okay, content. I think I have three more. The content. So what is actually analyzed in economics? Um, here I collected abstracts from all articles published in those top five journals uh, between the years 1965 and, and 2015. And I asked what share of these abstracts mentioned any of the following five words, gender, women, woman, sex, and or female. So it just had to mention one of those words one time. Um, in, 2000, in 1965, this was pretty much at zero, and it stayed zero for a long time. And we, we had this big peak. Uh, after 2015, I'm sure it went up. I don't have those data. Um, whatever, but <laughs> that's okay. But to make the point, 2015, here's the big peak. And you know what this number is? I don't know if you can see it, how big your screen is. This is about 1.3%. 1.3% of papers, so about one out of 100 papers in the top, top, top journals in economics said anything about gender or women or sex or female, which um, I think is, is pretty good evidence that um, women for a very long time were just not the topic of analysis, not considered interesting to study. Uh, in, in economics. This is part of why the Nobel going to Claudia Golden um, is, is quite meaningful when we look at this graph and, and then we, we see what happens, you know, eight years later, uh, we see that there is progress. That's great. Okay. Um, data. This is one of my favorite things. So quantitative data, because mainstream economics these days um, pretty much only works with quantitative data. Um, I looked at data from the HFCS. This is the Household Finance and Consumption Survey uh, for Austria. I chose this because um, Austria, the HFCS is a really important survey of, of household wealth and finances. And Austria is really interesting because Austria also includes data. If you ask them for it, they'll give it to you. Um, they also include data on the interviewer, so the person who interviewed the people in the household about how much wealth they have. So what do we see? When a male goes, so a guy goes and interviews a guy and says, hey, how much wealth do you have? The guy says, oh, I have about 250,000 euros. Okay, so wealth is like what your house is worth, if you have a car, if you have any stocks, you know, whatever you have in a savings account, whatever. So this isn't income, but it's wealth. Okay, so the guy says to the guy, I have 20, 250,000. Then a woman goes and interviews the guy, and the woman says, so how much wealth do you have? And he says, oh, I have about 300,000. These are averages over three surveys, 2014 to 2020. I have 6,000 observations. And if the male or the female interviewer was assigned to the households, it was completely random. So these differences can be understood as um, gender specific effects. So the male says to the woman, he has more money than he has said to the, to the man. When a man interviews a woman, the woman says, I only have 186,000. But when a woman talks to another woman, she says she has 220. So to me, these patterns really follow gender specific norms about who's allowed to have how much money. Women are supposed to have less money. They're supposed to be um, financially dependent on a man. Um, and this is exactly kind of what's happening when people report how much money they have. Men are telling women they have more and women are telling men they have less. So even the data, the quantitative data that are being used, and we want quantitative data because you know that's objective. Well, when they come from surveys and we look at the gender specific aspects, they're obviously not very objective and there are this these results show some gender specific biases in these data okay um i have two more no i have one more this is the last one so the methods how is economics done uh this one's not in the paper because i don't really know if i can kind of sell this point but um well, let's see. So I saw this thing on Twitter. <laughs> this is a, a screenshot from a paper from Econometrica. 
2015. This is one of the top five journals. And the paper is called Parenting with Style, Altruism and Paternalism in Intergenerational Preference Transmitters. So it's basically uh, how people choose how to parent. This is how people choose how to parent. If you want to decide if you should be an authoritarian parent, you should maximize this function. <laughs> so uh, obviously nobody really does this, right? But uh, it's kind of funny because there's definitely, just like casually speaking, there's a gender bias going on here of like how we think about how parenting happens. I will add, but like, as I said, I don't really know how to sell this exactly in the paper, so I left it out. But what I do want to add now is the fact that Claudia Golden got the Nobel Prize. And this is so interesting because Claudia Golden's work, which of course I've been following for years because it's so central and important. I and mean, the amazing thing about it is that it's pretty much descriptive statistics. She has theories, but in terms of quantitative work, it's descriptive statistics. So if, if I were working with a student these days and the student said, oh, I want to have a career in economics, what should I work on? And, and they came to me and showed me some descriptive statistics. I would say, I know that that's so interesting. I know that that's important, but you will never get this published in a top or even mid-ranked journal in economics because these days, everybody in economics at this moment in history is really into causal analysis. And descriptive dis descriptives don't say anything about causal analysis. And so if Claudia Golden were coming up in the career in her ranks now, she would never be where she is. So it's, it's really kind of interesting to see how methods change and what methods, you know, you, she's a tenured professor at Harvard who's basically, I don't know, almost 70 year, years old at the end of her career. Um, and it just shows that over time, um, methods change and, and what counts as good science changes. So um, there's something gendered about that too, you know, descriptive statistics is kind of more storytelling in economics these days. Um, and there's a gender implication of a word like storytelling. Okay, so um, well, I went over a little bit, but so what? This really, really matters, I think, for science and the production of knowledge um, because basically people with masculine characteristics and with masculine-centered concerns, those are the ones whose voices are heard. Um, this matters too because th this paper and another one of the same authors or two of the same authors show that on average, male and female economists have different views about really big important important issues so that means that uh if we want objectivity in science sandra harding talks about hard objectivity if we want really hard objectivity that means that we need a diverse group of people who have diverse ideas and obviously men and women do have diverse ideas we need this diverse group of people looking at the same phenomenon to be sure we're really being objective. If I put 10 people with the same characteristics in a room and I ask them to talk about a phenomenon and they've all grown up in the same place and had similar experiences and none of them have ever been poor and none of them have ever been really rich and whatever, none of them have ever experienced discrimination, they're going to see the phenomenon very differently than if I put 10 people with very diverse backgrounds in a room and I say, please discuss this issue. It's going to be a very different discussion. So for science, especially because we know there are gender differences in how men and male and female economists see the world, uh, we need that diversity if we want to have hard objectivity. Um, I mean, in science, we basically agree we're going to listen to people. So you invited me here to this talk. Um, if other people, <laughs> So journal editors and referees, department if as long as I have enough publications to show I'm a serious scholar, uh, as long as these other people found my work legitimate, uh, then I'm invited to talk to more people, right? Um, but but like my ability to be here and talk with you depended on other people approving of me and my work. And if this group of people, the editors, the referees, the department chairs, the deans, didn't approve of me, 
then I, these ideas wouldn't be out there. Indeed, I was denied the opportunity to get tenure at, at TU in, in Vienna, um, and I've had a very hard time publishing a lot of the stuff because that's not the agreement in economics to work on stuff like that. So um, what we're doing by you know, having these biases is basically that we're slowing down progress in science and um, we're biasing what we know and what we can know. Okay, that was it. I'm really looking forward to discussing with you